So later this evening, 7 p.m. Singapore time, our friend Henry Keith Hansen from IMS is going to be joining us. Uh, he ran a great session last year at uh, at our beta um, uh, in, in Chiang Mai, uh, all about getting your fundamentals right if you're starting up a, a, a media startup today. Uh, I think this is a really great session if you're trying to understand what vision, mission, strategy, and all that looks like. Uh, so if you're building a media startup, make sure you join us at 7 p.m. Singapore time. Henrik was sold out. He's a superstar. Uh, but hey, let's talk about our current stu superstar. Uh, we're, we're so lucky and so fortunate to have Terence here from Tech in Asia. You know, um, we all know who Tech in Asia is. We follow this story, especially us at, at Splice. Um, you know, we look to these guys for our for you know what they've done just not in their content but also their journey they've you know experimented with a bunch of different products different ways to uh look at media different ways to look at tech and uh we're here to learn from from terence who is the editor-in-chief uh terence uh tell us about this amazing journey we're so excited to have you here yeah i'm excited to be here so um yeah let me get my thing going Yes, sir. I have vacated the the, okay. the deck situation for you. Please there jump. You Very nice. Cool. Oh, okay. yeah. So, so this is like my, my first time giving a presentation ever on, on, on online. Uh, I think the last time I spoke about Tech in Asia was uh, at a physical event. So that was like pre-COVID. Um, and, and yeah, so back then we, we actually just launched our subscription. Right? So not much as much to talk about as compared to now. So hi guys, hi everyone. Uh, so uh, so glad to be here, and you know, uh, so glad to see everyone, and happy to, to to just share you know what I know and what we've learned over the past few years. Um, lots of mistakes, uh, lots of successes as well. So um, happy happy to just you know have an exchange. Um, so I, I'm I'm the uh, editor in chief of Tech in Asia, um, and yeah, basically here to talk about how we kept our company alive. So a bit more about us. Uh, we're basically like Splice, but uh, focusing on startup, tech startups. And uh, we started about 10 years ago. Um, so, so our CEO, Willis, was a student in SMU. Um, so he started this little blog. Uh, it was called like Pan Olsen back then. Um, and then, you know, a few years later, we changed it to Tech in Asia. So basically, we, we, we have a media arm. Uh, we do editorial content. We have jobs, marketplace. We have studios, which is like a, a branded content and events agency. Um, so some uh, stats about us, you know, thousands of subscribers, uh, more than 100,000 uh, newsletter subscribers, about a million uh, uh, visitors. So um, one big revenue stream for us is actually our conference. So our biggest conference was in Jakarta, right? So we had we, we see like thousands of people uh, gathering in a convention center in Jakarta. So that was, you know, has been in our history how we made uh, money. But, you know, that's gone um, because of COVID. So what now, right? That's, I think that's a question that, you know, a lot of uh, companies you know, are facing and it, it's been a tough journey. Um, but fortunately for us, we, we've been doing okay. Uh, so we've been profitable, profitable since 2019. Uh, this year we're doing fine uh, profitable as well and fingers crossed we hope to continue with that uh, so we, we have not had any layoffs uh, so far during the during due to the pandemic um, but I, I think things could easily have gone very differently for us right so uh, what exactly did we do uh, i'll come back to that uh, but first maybe a bit of history about us so, you know, as I mentioned, we, we covered tech and startups 10 years ago. Uh, so back then, I think advertising as a revenue stream was was uh, beginning to decline as, uh, for uh, online media. Uh, so we started out making money by by running conferences. Uh, so that, that was uh, our first conference in in uh, in Singapore. Right? I, I remember going there. I wasn't part of Tech in Asia yet. Uh, it was held in a... Uh, entire labor, right? Uh, for those in Singapore, uh, in the Sing Post building, um, and to be honest, like it, it's actually for business publications, it's not that 
difficult, I would say, to make money if you have an attentive audience, um, just because of the nature of the space, right? Sponsors are, are willing to pay uh, to access, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a lucrative audience who can fork out money, um, who are, you know, executives. So, so we could have been uh, easily profitable, you know, if we wanted to. But, you know, something happened. Um, we, we raised uh, venture capital money. And uh, so why is that a McDonald's sign? Well, uh, we, we actually met our first investor at a McDonald's outlet, you know, like uh, uh, the founder Willis was a poor student, right? And, and that's pretty much what he could afford. Um, and yeah, soon after that meeting, we raised our first round of funding. Um, and you know, venture capital money completely changes company, you know? Uh, so, you know, here's a look at, you know, how much we raised, about 12.9 million, um, some investors and names you might know. Um, so, uh, some, here's a, a chart that, that we made. Uh, so, VC money is, is called a risk capital for a reason, right? So, so basically, as a, if you're raising venture capital money, it allows you to, to take risks that uh, the company otherwise wouldn't pursue. So the closest analogy to this is like being on a rocket ship. So you're basically uh, just blasting off into space. It's not for, for everyone. Um, so for us, we, we were basically in the C zone. So what we call the slow and steady zone. Uh, basically, you know, like most companies, you know, we, we are just uh, one of many, you know, trying to, 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 to just grow steadily, you know, funding our growth with profits. Um, but when you raise money, you go into what's called the B zone, right? Where it's really about growing really fast and just hiring and hiring and 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 trying to gain market share. Um, but this, this chart, note, note that this chart is framed from the perspective of a VC or a startup founder. So um, the, not everyone, so even though the B zone is called the ideal zone, not everyone wants to be there. Um, it's just from a perspective of a VC or a startup, you know, you aspire to be the next tech giant, right? Um, so over the next few years, we tried many things, you know, expanding to Indonesia. I think that was probably our most successful venture. Uh, we expanded to India, China, Vietnam. So those didn't work out. Uh, Japan was okay. You know, we, we tried so many things, you know, like we covered consumer gaming for a while and we discovered that um, consumer uh, tech coverage just wasn't our thing. Um, interestingly, we actually had our first stab at subscriptions, right? That was in 2014. Um, so unfortunately, the process was slow and painful. Uh, Stripe wasn't available. Um, so we had to work through some payment processes and that was tough and, and it was really expensive. Um, but, you know, I, I felt like we should have persisted. Um, but yeah, that's another topic we can talk about. Um, we, we even did the whole pivot to video, you know, bus feedy social media thing. And, and that was, uh, again, another hard uh, lesson learned. It was really hard to monetize that. Uh, we have a database of startups. Uh, so we, we at, point, at some point in time, we tried to monetize that. Uh, we have a jobs marketplace that went well, that's ongoing. Branded content was successful. Um, we had a recruitment business, so we shut that down. Um, so, you know, so many experiments, you know, like we, we spent so much money on, on all of these things, right? And basically, we reached a turning point sometime in 2018. Um, we were running out of money, so our financial runway was down to, to less than a year. Um, so that gave us two choices, right? We could either raise more money or, or we had to lay people off. Um, so that's, that's when we, we had a second step at our paywall, our subscription program. Uh, so there was some time in 2018. And then this happened. Um, it's really confusing, uh, uh, this chart. Um, basically, that's blockchain for you. <laughs> um, so so we, we basically suspended our paywall because of, of this, right? Uh, so uh, some of you might might remember, you know, blockchain was, was all the hype. Uh, uh, it hit the plateau uh, in 2018. Um, so we... We were every startup was thinking, every tech startup was thinking about blockchain, and, and because I, I think because it's easy money, right? You know, you hear about these startups raising, you know, ICOs and raising tens of millions of of uh, cryptocurrencies. 
Um, so we, we, we had a, a blockchain project, um, it's called Tribe. So think of it like a Reddit um, or Forbes contributor model, but built on the blockchain. Um, but yeah, but we, we didn't push through in the end. I mean, I, I remember being excited about this project, you know, because it, it was really ambitious. Um, I think some things happened, right? So we weren't able to, to get enough buy-in from the team. Um, it would simply uproot everything we've done and really just overhaul um, the entire company, right? So, so this didn't happen. Um, I guess we were lucky that, that this didn't happen because, you know, the, the crash uh, came soon after. Um, but yeah. So, so basically, you know, once we decided that uh, we weren't going to do blockchain, we weren't going to, to raise uh, money for our blockchain project, um, that there was no moonshot idea left, right, to raise money from venture capitalists. And as you know, you know, VC firms, they, they want uh, moonshot ideas. They want uh, uh, startups that can potentially give them a 100x return, right? So, um, you know, once that is gone, we had to cut back and, and really start focusing on, on revenue and, and be a, a normal company again, I guess. Um, so, so that was a really low point for us. Uh, we, had, we had layoffs. I mean, we had many layoffs in the past, but uh, this was really the first uh, mass layoff in our headquarters in Singapore. Um, it's really like a strike at the heart, right? So from about 150 people, uh, we went down to 100. Uh, basically, cut away roles that roles that uh, weren't uh, cost effective or didn't contribute to revenue. Uh, we we cut down on a lot of projects. Uh, uh, I think one thing we found that was that we really lost focus, right? Um, so yeah, it became a numbers game. It was really brutal, you know. But yeah, that's what it comes down to uh, in a huge layoff exercise. Um, and you know, some people weren't happy as well. You know, they felt like the the layoffs were justified, and some decisions right were questioned. Um, but you know, I think that the the thing that doesn't get covered in the media often is that um, the layoffs don't just stop there, right? Uh, the attrition doesn't just stop at the layoffs. Um, you know, when people go, you know, your friends leave, you want to leave as well. Uh, so from from hundred, we actually went down to seventy plus, uh, just solely as a result of natural attrition. Um, like one example was that our our tech team uh, shrank, right? Because you no, know, we are no longer a technology platform, which was what we tried to be. Um, and engineers is uh, create working on huge projects, you know, technically ch challenging projects. Yeah, so our office got too big from us. Uh, so, so this picture is our old office, and and it was not as cozy anymore. So, th that warmth was gone, right? And it's kind of depressing to to go back to an office uh, with many empty desks. Um, but I mean, the fortunate thing was that, you know, that didn't last, you know, things gradually got back to normal and, and you know, we, we, we did recover. So, um, there's always an upside, right, to all of this. Yeah, but, um, our subscription project was back on after the layoffs and basically, you know, we did, a, we, we learned a lot from so many other publications. Uh, so, uh, we basically looked at what the information the US was doing. Um, I think into the can as well. We looked at and, and various other publications. Uh, so you know, we, we gave out like a one-time discount. We built a mailing list. Uh, used it to to collect feedback. Uh, we did a pricing survey. Tried to gauge uh, what the audience would what would be willing to pay for. And I think it wasn't an easy decision uh, because like I I was doubtful right whether it, it would uh, work right and. Uh, but I think the, the, the key thing for us was that uh, we found that, you know, it's a reversible decision. You know? It's something that, you know, it, if it doesn't work, to roll it back, right? And no harm done. Um, so we felt that it was, it was worth a shot. Um, uh, most importantly, we, we needed revenue. So this was a, a, a good test of that. Um, there were some things going for us. Uh, we had good branding, we had sizable audience. Um, so we had an inbuilt funnel from which to monetize. Uh, and the challenge on the flip side was that, uh, you know, we, we weren't exactly focused on, on uh, uh, high quality content that people would pay for, right? So, you know, when you're, you're, you're chasing up the page views, it's, it's a whole different thing. Um, so I think there are definitely doubts, right, from, from uh, some of our readers, right, whether this would work, you know, what, whether they would, why would they pay for this, right, when there are so many other options available online. Um, 
Yeah, so basically we started initially with a soft paywall and then uh, later on we, we, we implemented some uh, member-only content because we found that that converted really well for us. Well, we put up a barrier, right? That's, uh, that's what happens. Um, so we've been doing well. So this basically is our uh, total subscribers. Uh, so uh, basically, we've had a, a net uh, gain in subscribers every week since we launched. Um, so very encouraging. And yeah, and and I think I think what uh, encourages me is that it's the feedback from readers, right? So um, like initially, you know, when we announced that we would launch a paywall. Uh, you know, we, we get very brutal feedback from, from some of our readers, right? And then um, I think the amazing thing was that, you know, later on, you know, the same reader would come back to us and say, hey, you know, like, read this article, it's really good. Um, and, and yeah, this is worthy of a, a paywall publication. Um, so so really happy that, that we did this. Um, so some, some of the articles that we've done recently, so we, you know, we, we look into, for example, uh, what an online regulator uh, was doing in Indonesia and some of the uh, dubious practices that, that were happening. Um, so, you know, we do a lot, a lot of like investigative stuff. Uh, Honest B, you know, everyone knows Honest B, right? That, that was a, a huge uh, story for us. Um, and yeah, we, 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 we scrutinize financial numbers and, and claims, you know, like startups making big claims. So we look at that. Uh, so this is a really interesting project. So uh, it's what happens when you put a data scientist a, and a journalist together in the same room. And basically we, we took our startup data or funding data, uh, funding of startups data. And we sort of like mapped out relationships and, and uncover hidden relationships between uh, VCs in, in Southeast Asia. Um, yeah, we also visualize uh, we've done some uh, interesting visualizations. So, uh, like we trace, you know, the history of founders and which companies they came from. Um, so this was a fun one. So, um, I mean, we're still doing conferences, uh, but but like Splice, uh, we also have uh, like our virtual conference. So basically, one thing we're trying is that we're, we're bundling our um, such our event. Uh, event, I guess, access into our subscriptions. So for example, if you're a core subscriber, you get uh, basically to access, free access to the conference, right? And and we, we also have one thing we just launched is a event subscription. So the plan is for us to have a series of events and then we, we charge a subscription for that. So as a, I guess as a Tech in Asia subscriber, um, you can sort of like, pay just to go for the events or you can get the whole package right Con content plus uh event or we, we also have a light plan that we launched in the midst of the, the pandemic where it's uh limited access to our content but, but it's more affordable right so so you know just different things that we we try and see what works yeah so back to this chart. Um, so now we, we, are, we are back to the C zone. And to be honest, like, um, I'm kind of glad um, that we're, we're back here. And basically, yeah, and I, I, think, I think it's given us some stability, uh, much needed stability. Uh, we, we don't find our direction, you know, our direction changing every few months. Uh, so uh, I think I think a lot of lessons here, really, like as a founder, as an entrepreneur, uh, really have a clear idea of what company you're trying to build, what your, what your goals are, right? And even as an employee, you know, like uh, understand what kind of company you're going into. Um, so, you know, company employee match is very important. Yeah, so a, a few key takeaways. Uh, so as I mentioned, right, think carefully before, you know, raising money from VCs. Um, I think on the hindsight, we probably would have done it again uh, because we like, like our first investor really gave us some, it's like business 101, right? So um, having that, that crucial investor, I think it, it's very important, someone who can really guide you. Uh, but I think 
one thing we probably would have done differently is persisted in our uh, subscription efforts. So like, uh, like I mentioned, we, we started actually in 2014, right? So that was uh, very early. Um, so, but the thing was like, I think our mindset was like, we were chasing after, you know, the, the big moon shot, right? So our subscriptions was growing slowly. It wasn't something that seemed like um, it would be huge, right? Uh, but yeah, you know, hindsight is, is always perfect, right? So, uh, so basically, we, we we didn't persist in that, and yeah, I, and the second thing was that you know, with layoffs, um, there's a saying, you know, like a, a deep cut is is better than you know, death by a thousand cuts. It's not very elegantly phrased, but uh, so basically, the the thing here is that um, and I think I know a lot, a lot of companies, you know, are probably thinking about layoffs and. Uh, and, and how to do it, you know, how to do it humanely and in a way that uh, is the most humanely possible. I think the reality is that it's very difficult because, um, you know, when you're making decisions like that, it, it comes down to numbers sometimes and um, sometimes hard choices have to be made, right? And, and imperfect choices. Um, so basically, our, our the layoff that we did in Singapore was, was planned uh, and executed in within two or two, three weeks. Um, the reason we, we, we did we definitely wanted to do it as quickly as possible, right? Because uh, the longer you wait, you know, the more uncertainty you, you cause and rumors start to spread. Uh, and things could go really haywire in the office, right? So um, it, it was a bit of a surprise to to I think some of the people who were affected. Um, but yeah, I, I think at the end of the Day, it prob it's still probably better to have a one decisive move um, than to you know have so many cuts, right? And, and I see that happening in some some companies where it's it's just uh, hurts uh, company morale uh, so badly. Um, and yeah, uh, basically doing this allows everyone to move on and focus on the road ahead. Um, I think a few things we could have done differently. So maybe I think people want options. You know, optionality is is uh, I think something that's inbuilt in us, right? So could we have given people a choice? I think instead of a mass layoff, perhaps a pay cut, right? A, a company-wide pay cut would have been a better option. Um, but we've, we've actually learned from this. So so like with COVID, um, what we do now is that we've, we have a clearer way of communicating how we do pay, pay cuts or layoffs if necessary. Um, so there are certain triggers that uh, needs to be met, right, before certain actions are taken. So all of this basically is, is communicated upfront with uh, employees in our monthly town halls. Um, so our CEO shares financial numbers, you know, with the team every month along the triggers and how close we are or far away from meeting those triggers, right? Um, so another lesson would be basically to keep the team lean in good times. I think this is very difficult to do because I, I think companies, everyone is afraid of, of cutting costs or having layoffs. Um, nobody likes to do it. Um, and layoffs are a last resort. Uh, but I think the key thing here is feedback. Um, so, you know, measures are really important, right? If there are layoffs, uh, uh, don't delay. At the same time, it's the last resort, right? So always have that feedback loop built in. Have conversations with your colleagues if they need to step up, right? Um, or if there's a misfit, right? So so basically allowing both parties to come up with solutions, you know, um, before the last resort. Uh, so so basically, I think maybe the bright side for us to, to the whole thing was that um, our layoffs happened before COVID, so people could actually move on and, 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 and find jobs, right? Um, um, you know, so, so that's like the, the silver lining. So I, I think a key lesson here basically is to, to stay vigilant, you know, and lean even in good times, right? Because um, you never know what will happen, you know. And, and, and so I think as entrepreneurs, as managers, um, that's always something to, to remember. Um, okay, so moving on, um, just a few more slides. Uh, so this is basically how we are tracking our um, subscriptions and how we're doing. Um, so we, 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 we look up, we look at a few key metrics, uh, next subscriber gain. Um, we look at how each article converts to how, how they drive subscriptions. Um, and we look at customer lifetime value. So, um, 
yeah, I, I'm really bad at math, so I'm not gonna go through the, the this. Uh, but it's just for reference, right? And I think you know there's plenty of uh, literature online about customer lifetime value. So basically, it's projecting how how much revenue each customer will generate over the, their lifetime of, of using your your service, right? So so we track those very closely. Um, so basically, the, the goal of doing this is to make sure that again it comes back to keeping the team lean, right? So we, we have overall subscription goals. You know, we we set goals for each writer. Um, again, you know, this, this might be slightly controversial, right? But I think the goal is not to 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 I think uh, be slave drivers and, and force our writer to meet those goals. Right? But rather, it, it's more of, uh, for us to to help each writer find the fit, right, with uh, within the the audience that we serve. Um, so, for example, if, if let's say a a writer has been focusing on a few topics and it's not working out and we sort of know that and then we can adjust change the strategy right and and, and get um the, the writer to adapt right um and the key is not to be too focused on the numbers it's also to to make sure that you know there's culture fit there's a uh, attitude skills fit um yeah so the danger is to to focus too much on the numbers yeah so I mean, there are definitely limits to 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 this approach. I think uh, like we, we can experiment with content types. We can then track the numbers, how how and see how they do. Um, and also, basically, it allows me to to track project. Like as a chief editor, I think uh, you rarely see this in other publications. I actually do keep a close watch on costs and revenue. Um, so besides editing articles and mentoring writers, I basically looking at the bottom line, right? So um, for, for me, it's really about survival right? and making sure that we stay lean. Um, so one benefit of this also is that um, based on those, these numbers, like we, we can roughly tell, uh, we, can, we can come up with like a strike zone of, uh, of a salary range. So basically when we make hires, we use this as a guideline. Um, so we don't, you know, hire someone that's that's too expensive, right? Um, and if we 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 do see a really senior journalist, uh, then you know it it, get, it tells us it, then we have to do our best to make sure that okay, this is someone that's gonna be a unicorn, right? It's gonna be be able to to really contribute to the team. Um, so you know, having these numbers, I think, helps us stay disciplined. You know, we don't hire beyond our budget unnecessarily. Um, I mean, the, the flip side to this approach, obviously, is that there are some things that it's just difficult to track with numbers, right? You know, like, how do you measure novelty? How do you measure freshness? Um, how do you measure innovation? I think, I think these are things that, um, that can't be tracked, and so there are limitations. Yeah, so I, I mean, it's really difficult to, to predict what the future will bring. You know, uh, these are, are really uncertain times, and, and yeah, I, I think if there's one takeaway from this, I think, you know, price with crisis uh, comes opportunity. Um, like, I, I don't know, we, we uh, you know, like we launched our subscription in the midst of, of right after our layoffs, right, when we were low, low on cash. Um, so yeah, I, I think, you know, there's nothing like survival, right, to, to motivate us and, and help us to, to, to find you know, our next uh, breakthrough. So I, I'm sure, you know, that there's gonna be a lot of like, uh, startups that will come out of that, that will be started in the midst of this pandemic and and yeah that, that could go on to do great things um yeah so that's it for me uh, open to questions we love to exchange notes uh one thing we are doing is that we are we're, we're hiring and uh we do have some positions to fill in the newsroom so yeah that's been keeping me busy as well so yeah thanks guys thanks for your time that was really awesome, Terence. Thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna get. Uh, well, I'm gonna go for the first question before <laughs> before we get to all the questions. Alan is beating there. everybody to the jump <laughs> in the chat box there. Um, so you mentioned that the management shares the financial numbers with with the team on a regular basis. Uh, exactly what numbers are being shared, and also what is the response like usually from from the team? Do they ask uh, for the questions? Are they taking a, a deeper interest in, in this? Yeah, interesting. I mean, we, we pretty much share everything, right? So um, we share revenue, we share what our profit loss uh, was for a particular month. 
um, we, we break it down by teams and by countries. Uh, so it's, it's pretty much full transparency. I think, you know, the bottom line is that we, we trust our teammates to, to, uh, to, to, to obviously keep things confidential. Um, we've got some triggers, right? So, um, what are some triggers? Like if, for example, you know, our, our runway runs below a certain amount of certain number of months, that's like a, an example of the trigger. Uh, so in terms of reactions, to be honest, <laughs> it is like it's like typically typical Asian culture. Right? Everyone just keeps quiet, you know. Whenever, whenever we have these town halls, um, but yeah, I, I think you know sometimes we do ask questions and and uh, um, uh, yeah, it, I, I think overall it's been good. I, I think um, everyone knows exactly where the company is, um, so you know. Uh, Basically, we, we try and empower them by letting them know, you know what's happening. Yeah, that's that makes a lot of sense. Speaking of um, speaking of people answering questions and the Asian culture of keeping quiet, I promise you, we're going to unmute microphones, and we're going to be uh, having people ask their own questions. Um, in fact, hey Terence, you want to stop sharing your screen? Um, yeah, just just. Uh, there you go. We have the nice mosaic of everybody. Uh, we can all pretend we're in the same room. Hey, Mike, if you're still there, you have a great question. Do you want to jump in, unmute, and ask it? Yep, I'm here. Can you hear me? Hey, Mike. So, uh, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I just uh, I was very interested when you were talking about the VC money, Terence. You sort of part answered my question already. Because um, I always feel VCs, and you alluded to this, they're really interested in, as you said, the moonshots, and they're looking for some tech breakthrough, and that usually is a, plat a big transformational platform investment. And it's not great for a content business, because um, that's not what really they're looking for. Uh, and you mentioned, you, you know, you did learn a lot from that. So I just wondered, I mean, was that a big distraction for you? Um, in retrospect, would you do it again? Or... Would you still take the money? And as you said, you've got an opportunity to try lots of different things and maybe a bit more focused in uh, in those sort of, you still, these would be moonshot bets. Um, I don't think, uh, I could be wrong, the VCs would be looking for a gradual subscription business, which is strong. They'd be looking for something transformational. So would you do it again? Or do you think, you know, you learn a lot, but in retrospect, it was a bit of a distraction for you? Um, well, I, I, I mean, I, I think I, I can't speak for, for, for the CEO, but I, I think just from my perspective, uh, I guess the answer is yes. Uh, I mean, for a very cliche reason, like, like you know, we wouldn't have learned all this. Um, and I think the, the nuance is, is that you know, th there are different kinds of VCs. Uh, some, um, I, I think our first VC definitely what was great, right? Because he, he taught us so much. Um, on the flip side, you know, that I, I think a lot of VCs probably didn't see subscriptions or subscription media as a promising area. I think that has been probably the reality. Um, so which is why, you know, like we didn't really go out and pitch a, a subscription based uh, business. Hey, invest in us. We are a subscription media. Um, that said, I think, you know, like in the US, you know, we, we see BuzzFeed, for example, raising a lot of money, um, Vox Media, Vice. So I, I think, you know, maybe the US market, it's way more developed. You know, there's a, a wider variety of uh, investors uh, who ha have an appetite for, for, for such things. Uh, and also it's a matter of timing, right? So I think maybe just a couple of years ago, you know, VCs were going after that moonshot idea. I think now, if you talk to VCs, they they, they want like uh, businesses that are uh, have a, a bigger shot of getting profitable, right? So uh, it depends on the timing. Um, so, but I think despite that, we yeah we probably would have could have persisted in doing the subscriptions, um, but I think you know uh like like just you know it wasn't something that was on our radar right so if anything yeah could we have done something differently as a management team to sort of like you know 
appraise ideas or business ideas differently. I think maybe that's the lesson. I don't, yeah, we, 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 we like, you know, my, my boss does what he wants to do. You know, we do what we want to do, despite what investors say, right? Um, I think, you know, when we launched our subscription, yeah, some investors did like, hey, you know, are you sure this is going to work? Um, but, you know, there are no shareholder battles. You know, we, we do what we want to do. Our in investors basically just give us advice. Yeah. So I, I think it came down to management and, and, you know, we just didn't think that this was something that would work initially, right? Yeah. Um, I want to go to a question by Haas. Uh, very good question here about how you how you think about how how will you review staffing needs based on outsourced services that are available versus the talent experience that are available here in Singapore? Uh, I imagine most of your team is here, right, in Singapore. And how do you consider uh, you know uh, outsourcing options for that? You mean like uh, full timers versus part timers, or or like? More in terms of, uh, I, I imagine, I mean, Haas, please, please jump in if, uh, if you can help me clarify this one. But it, what I'm reading is that this is a question about um, how do you decide whether to insource in Singapore or outsource, um, you know, elsewhere? Yeah, um, I think there, there, are, there are a few factors to look at. I think uh, if cost uh, is a factor, then you would lean towards outsourcing. Um, so we do outsource, uh, so so we do see cost as a huge factor for us. At the same time, I think there's also a confluence of, of, of factors like um, it, we cover India, we cover uh, various countries in Southeast Asia and uh, Asia Pacific. So uh, we do need to make hires in, in various countries. Uh, so I think, you know, there's an alignment there. Um, uh, so it's not just about cost, right? Like if you're covering India, you need someone in India, if you're covering Vietnam, you definitely need someone in Vietnam, right? So we do have a, like a journalist in Vietnam, we have people in Singapore. Um, so I, I would say, yeah, cost is a factor. Uh, I think the needs of the content as well, like where, which markets do we need journalists? Uh, where's the talent available, right? So I think um, um, we, we hire based on, on I think those, uh, those three factors. I think outsourcing, there are definitely some issues, right? So um uh like culture you know like uh it's an issue you have to sort of find ways around uh, having a, a purely uh remote team um i hope that yeah so so those are, are the, the things that yeah i consider uh yeah nice and yeah uh before i get to uh, Chris Brummett's question. I just want to mention that he gets the uh, best hammock at beta price. Uh, <laughs> so awesome. Um, uh, Chris, Chris is asking, uh, Terence, um, who do you see as your biggest competitor? Hey, Chris, good to see you. Um, so, so basically, yeah, it, it's like the, the, the entire business media scene is huge hugely competitive, right? So um, uh, there's, there's, there's the big business uh, publications like Reuters and Bloomberg, um, I think. So though they won't be direct competitors uh, because uh, they focus on the big guys. Um, at the same time, you know, I think there are guys focusing on, on, the, on more on startups, the smaller companies. Uh, so, you know, regionally, there's so many, right, like techno uh, in China, focusing on China, uh, E27, for example, focuses on startups uh, as well. Uh, I think that the CAN as well, uh, doing really well in India and, and uh, Southeast Asia. So, you know, there, there are a lot of like competitors, I would say. Um, yeah, so I think, yeah, that's the thing with subscription media and media in general, right? So everyone's fighting for that wallet, right? Uh, and um, I think there's, yeah, there's also like subscription fatigue, right? So um, it's, yeah, it's definitely plenty of competitors, yeah. Can we As talk a little bit about uh, uh, subscriptions? Um, so, you know, you said it was a very conflicting time when the company tried to decide whether to go for subscriptions or not. Uh, and there was a bit of I guess a bit of uh, internal friction around that, right? How how long did that process take for for the team to be okay with it? Uh, and what did you have to do to make that that mindset jump 
to yeah. your subscriptions. Yeah, I think I think that the conflict I was referring to was more related to the blockchain stuff. Um, but now that you mentioned it, there there was definitely some some conflict around subscriptions. Um, I think not as big as blockchain. Uh, that was really that would be hugely disruptive, right? But uh, I think yeah, internally it, it's just the, the typical questions, you know, like will will people want to pay for the content? Uh, like why would people pay for this? You know, this would limit my audience. Uh, would people still want want to want tech in Asia to cover their company if you know if it's behind a paywall? Um, yeah, but uh, so there was some I would say mild resistance. Um, but yeah, I, I think at the end of the day, it comes down to survival. Hey, you know, like, yeah, we, we just need to survive, right? So I think that um, sort of rallies people together. And um, I think also the fact that, you know, okay, this is something we could reverse and tweak, right? It doesn't go well. Um, so I think those are, are the, the reasons, I mean, the, the, the ways that we try and persuade people. Yeah. You know, I... Um... I'm going to say that um, if if there are no more questions, we're going to keep jumping in because um, seriously, like I said in the beginning, we've been tracking you guys and learning from you. Um, you know, it is a barometer of of how you know startup in the the media startup industry is is doing in this part of the world. Um, you know, my question is related, Terence, to to you know the relationship between. Um, you know, value proposition and your newsroom between revenue numbers and, you know, how the newsroom feels about those. And you part answered that, you know, you are, your journalists are in fact, you, you know, you make it part of their key, um, um, you know, requirements that you, you require of them to be invested in their numbers, right? Um, how do they feel about new product or, you know, productization of, of what, what you're doing? I, th I think, uh, well, uh, I think that the key is for us, uh, it's very sensitive, right? Because uh, I think we we don't want them to feel like they're basically judged based on the number. Uh, so I think what we've tried to do is to, to communicate it in a way that's as empathetic and as sensitive as we can. I think uh, we make it clear that, you know, like, like I make it clear that, you know, those are my numbers, right? Like as, as the editor in chief, you know, um, basically I'm in the same boat as you guys, you know. Right? So uh, I think I, I try to do that and and put myself basically in in the same boat as them. Um, I think basically the the goal is I I think for them uh, to feel just a little bit of pressure. Um, but you know, without being overwhelmed, right? And I think it, 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 we also try to drive home the message that um, hey, you know, like like uh, everyone you know, has a part to play uh, in in the business. Uh, every you know, I think the, the benefit of being in a smaller company is that right, you, know, you really make an impact. Um, so I I think you know we I think the way we try and communicate it is is really important, right? And so far, yeah. And, and to be honest, we just really just launched this. So maybe I can give you a better answer in a year, right? So um, maybe, yeah, uh, when the, maybe I haven't felt the the repercussions yet. Um, yeah, uh, but so far I think I think everyone's reacting well. I'm not seeing a, a rebellion. Um, I think I think people are, uh, you know, doing what they do, and and, and yeah, uh, it's yeah on a day to day basis. It's yeah, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, so I think basically this forces us to, in a way, uh, have that constant feedback loop. How can we improve things? How can we drive things? Yeah. So yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Great, um, Hannah. Why don't you jump in with your with your question? Thanks, Alan. Hi, Terence. Uh, just curious to know if and if, if whatever is okay to share. I'm just curious to know what are some of the subscriber retention strategies, especially for online subscriptions. Churn is very very high, and uh, subscribers are very fickle people. Hmm. Uh, retention strategies. So uh, basically, you know, like if someone unsubscribes, um, we would like give them an offer, right? So I think I think a lot of publications do that. Um, the the information uh, for one. Um, I think trying to strike a balance between 
uh, quantity of content versus quality. Uh, it, like we 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 we, uh, we swing, you know, between the uh, the pendulum, our pendulum swings, you know, like both ways. And uh, I think I think what we found is that you know not everyone wants to read like a ten minute long article, right? So I think having that daily diet is, is still important. Um, yeah, we find that the newsletters are this you know super important, and I think that's what everyone other publication. Uh, it's, it's finding out as well. Um, so, you know, we're constantly tweaking our newsletters. Uh, so we have daily newsletters. We have newsletters for uh, different groups uh, within our audience. Um, like I, I write a newsletter once a week as well. Um, so I think, yeah, newsletters are uh, hugely important. Yeah, so I think broadly speaking, those like are our retention strategies. I think it in the end, it comes down to content really like um, like we just have to keep writing and reporting stuff that's relevant and uh, stuff that our audience wants to read. I mean, that's the best retention strategy. Yeah. Fantastic. Listen, if there are no more questions, um, you know, this might be a good time to wrap this up. We have five minutes, four minutes on the hour and just in time. I thought I was surprised that Florence hadn't jumped in yet um, before I wrap up. Florence, go for it. Unmute yourself. Sorry, I was just rushing to get into time for my question. You mentioned earlier, the last um, word. Terence, that uh, Indonesia has been monumental in terms of growth. I just would like to know what makes Indonesia different and unique, apart from the sizable um, market, con con consumer, and also in the last seven years, there's just rapid growth in terms of startups in the country. We gave birth into at least a couple of unicorns, and there are no more unicorns uh, these days. So maybe you can shed a light on that. It'll be interested. Uh, I'll be interested to to learn if you have any uh, editorial or publication or content strategy that you use specifically for Indonesia. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So uh, so on our Bahasa side, we we act, we do have a, a separate team that that covers the the industry in in Bahasa. Uh, so. Basically, the approach is slightly different. Uh, it's more technical, more how tos and uh, product strategy and and um, and all that. So that's something that has uh, done really well for us. Uh, so they actually just launch a subscription, right? So uh, so we are at about like five hundred subscribers in in just for the Bahasa website. Um, the, definitely, it's very different in that the pricing uh, definitely is different. Slower uh, payments system is different. Um, we actually find that, like, uh, actually because of the pandemic, we there's more sync ups between the international side and and um, and the Bahasa side. So so it's uh, actually gotten I guess less separate, right? It, uh, less unique in a sense. Um, I, I think, yeah. So, so I think that's uh, what we've done. I mean, nothing too special in, in that. You know, it's pretty much the same things that we do on the as uh, uh, compared to the international side. Yeah, the key difference is just the management style. I think before the pandemic, um, they basically run their own show. You know, uh, they they do their own things, and then. Yeah, I, I found that you know once the pandemic started, you know we, we needed to close ranks and, and really sync up on on uh, on many things. Um, it is like peacetime versus wartime, right? So you know when when you know it's the, it's, it's, it's the pandemic, everyone sort of just rallies together and, and uh, we're so much more in sync. Uh, you know when you know things are times are good, you know you uh, you basically you know that's like your your Google's like four day. Uh, like one one day where they can just do anything, right, and do their own projects. Um, so yeah, I, I think that was the, the key change. Yeah. Nice. I want to work in a place like that, Alan. <laughs> Let's do this. Let's do. <laughs> uh, listen, we're we're gonna have Terence's deck in our resources section. This video is going to be there. Uh, notes from the session. There's going to be a summary. Uh, Terence, thank you so much. Um, you know, as always, a masterclass. Uh, um, lots of stuff to learn. Um, please come back in a couple of hours uh, for the mighty Henrik Keith. 
on management uh, fundamentals at seven o'clock Singapore time. Big, big thank you to all of you. Uh, thank you so much for coming, giving us your Monday, well, an hour of your Monday. And big thank you to our sponsors.